Chapter 17. At this moment, the scene inside the peach itself was one of an indescribable chaos. James Henry Trotter was lying bruised and battered on the floor of the living room amongst a tangled mess, mass of centipede and earthworm and spider and ladybug and glowworm and old green grasshopper. In the whole history of the world, no travelers had ever had a more terrible journey than these unfortunate creatures. It started out well, with much laughing and shouting, and for the first few seconds, as the peach had begun to roll slowly forward, nobody had minded being tumbled about a little bit. And then it went bump. And the centipede had shouted, That was Aunt Sponge! And then bump again, That was Aunt Spiker! There had been a tremendous burst of cheering all around. But as soon as the peach rolled out of the garden and began to go down the steep hill, rushing and plunging and bounding madly downward, then the whole thing became a nightmare. James found himself being flung up against the ceiling, then back onto the floor, then sideways against the wall, then up onto the ceiling again, and up and down and back and forth and round and round. And at the same time, all the other creatures were flying through the air in every direction. And so there were chairs and the sofa, not to mention the 42 boots belonging to the centipede. Everything on all of them were being rattled around like a, like peas inside an enormous rattle that was being rattled mad, rattled by a mad giant who refused to stop. To make it worse, something went wrong with the glowworm's lightning system, sorry, lighting system, and the room was in pitchy darkness. There were screams and yells and curses and cries of pain, and everything kept going round and round, and once James made a frantic grab at some thick bars sticking out from the wall, only to find they were a couple of centipedes' legs. Let me go, you idiot! shouted the centipede, kicking himself free, and James was promptly flung across the room into the old green grasshopper's horny lap. Twice he got tangled up in Miss Spider's legs, a horrid business, and toward the end, the poor earthworm, who was cracking himself like a whip every time he flew through the air from one side of the room to the other, coiled himself around James's body in a panic and refused to unwind. Oh, it was a frantic and terrible trip, but it was all over now, and the room was suddenly very still and quiet. Everybody was beginning slowly and painfully to disentangle it himself from everybody else. Let's have some light, shouted the centipede. Yes, they cried. Light, give us some light. I'm trying, answered the poor glowworm. I'm doing my best. Please be patient. They all waited in silence. Then a faint greenish light began to glimmer out of the glowworm's tail, and this gradually became stronger and stronger until it was anyway enough to see by. Some great journey, the centipede said, limping across the room. I shall never be the same again, murmured the earthworm. Nor I, the ladybug said. It's taken years off my life. But, my dear friends, cried the old green grasshopper, trying to be cheerful, we are there. Where, they asked. Where, where is there? I don't know, the old green grasshopper said, but I'll bet it's somewhere good. We're probably at the bottom of a coal mine, the earthworm said gloomily. We certainly went down and down and down very suddenly at the moment. I felt it in my stomach. I still feel it. Perhaps we're in the middle of a beautiful country full of songs and music, the old green grasshopper said. We're near the seashore, James said eagerly, with lots of other children down in the sand for me to play with. Pardon me, murmured the ladybug turning a trifle pale, but am I wrong in thinking that we seem to be bobbing up and down? Bobbing up and down, they cried. What on earth do you mean? Ooh, you're still giddy from the journey, the old green grasshopper told her. You'll get over it in a minute. Is everybody ready to go upstairs now and take a look around? Yes, yes, they chorused. Come on, let's go. I refuse to show myself out of doors in my bare feet, the centipede said. I have to get my boots on again first. Oh, for heaven's sake, let's not go through all that nonsense again, the earthworm said. Let's all lend the centipede a hand and get it over with, the ladybug said. Come on. So they did, all except Miss Spider, who was set about weaving a long rope ladder that would reach from the floor up to the hole in the ceiling. The green the old green grasshopper had wisely said they must not risk going out of the side entrance when they didn't know where they were, but must first of all go up onto the top of the peach and have a look around.
So a half an hour later, when the rope ladder had been finished and hung, the f and the 42nd boot had laced neatly onto the centipede's 42nd foot, they were all ready to go out. Amidst mounting excitement and shouts of, Here we go, boys, the promised land. I can't wait to see it. The whole company climbed up the ladder one by one and disappeared into a dark, soggy tunnel in the ceiling that went steeply, almost vertically upward. Chapter 18. A minute later, they were out in the open, standing on the very top of the peach near the stem, blinking their eyes in the strong sunlight and peering nervously around. What happened? Where are we? Well, this is impossible, unbelievable, terrible. I told you we were bobbing up and down, the ladybug said. We're in the middle of the sea, cried James. And indeed they were. A strong current and a high wind had carried the peach so quickly from the shore that, they had, that the land was already out of sight. All around them lay the vast black ocean, deep and hungry. Little waves were bibbling against the sides of the peach. But how did it happen, they cried. Where are the fields? Where are the woods? Where's England? Nobody, not even James, could understand how in the world a thing like this could have come about. Ladies and gentlemen, the old green grasshopper said, trying very hard to keep the fear and disappointment all out of his voice. I am afraid we can't. We find ourselves in a rather awkward situation. Awkward, cried the earth one. My dear old grasshopper, we are finished. Every one of us is about to perish. I may be blind, you know, but that much I can see quite clearly. Off with my boots, shouted the centipede. I cannot swim with my boots on. I cannot swim at all, cried the ladybug. Nor can I, wailed the glowworm. No, I, said Miss Spider. None of us three girls can swim a single stroke. But you won't have to swim, said James cal calmly. We are floating beautifully, and sooner or later a ship is bound to come along and pick us up. They all stared at him in amazement. Are you quite sure that we're not sinking? The ladybug asked. Oops, I didn't even say that. Are you quite sure that we are not sinking? The ladybug asked. Of course I'm sure, answered James. Go and look for yourselves. They all ran over to the side of the peach and peered down at the water below. The boy is quite right, the old green grasshopper said. We are floating beautifully. Now we must all sit down and keep perfectly calm. Everything will be all right in the end. Oh, what absolute nonsense, cried the earthworm. Nothing is ever right in the end, and well, you know it. Poor earthworm, the ladybug said, whispering in James's ear. He loves to make everything into a disaster. He hates to be happy. He is only happy when he is gloomy. Now, isn't that odd? But then I suppose just being an earthworm is enough to make a person pretty gloomy, don't you agree? If this peach is not going to sink, the earthworm was saying, and if we're not going to be drowned, then every one of us is going to starve to death instead. Do you realize that we haven't had a thing to eat since yesterday morning? By golly, he's right, cried the centipede. For once, earthworm is right. Of course I'm right, the earthworm said, and we're not likely to find anything around here either. We shall get thinner and thinner and thirstier and thirstier, and we shall all die a slow and grisly death from starvation. I'm dying already. I'm slowly shriveling up for want of food. Personally, I'd rather drown. Oh, with good heavens, you must be blind, said James. You know very well I'm blind, snapped the earthworm. There was no need to rub it in. Oh, I didn't mean that, said James quickly. I'm sorry, uh, but can't you see that? See, shouted poor earthworm, how can I see if I am blind? James took a deep, slow breath. Can't you realize, he said patiently, that we have enough food here to last us for weeks and weeks? Where, they said, where? Why, the peach, of course. Our whole ship is made of food. Jumping what? Jumping Jehoshaphat, they cried. We never thought of that. My dear James, said the old green grasshopper, lying a front leg affectionately on James's shoulder. I don't know what we do without you. You are so clever. Ladies and gentlemen, we are saved again. We most certainly not, said the earthworm. You must be crazy. You cannot eat the ship. It's the only thing keeping us up. We shall starve if we don't, said the centipede. And we shall drown if we do, cried the earthworm. Oh dear, oh dear, said the old grasshopper. Now we're worse off than before. Couldn't we just eat a little bit of it, asked Miss Spider. I'm so dreadfully hungry. 
You can eat all you want, Jims answered. It would take us weeks and weeks to make any sort of dent in this enormous peach. Surely you can see that. Good heavens, he's right again, cried the old green grasshopper, clapping his hands. It would take weeks and weeks, of course it would. But let's not go making a lot of holes all over the deck. I think it would be simply scoop it out of that tunnel over there, the one we've just come up by. An excellent idea, said the ladybug. What... What are you looking so worried about, Earthworm? The centipede asked. What's the problem? The problem is, the Earthworm said, the problem is, what the problem is, there is no problem. Everyone burst out laughing. Cheer up, Earthworm, they said. Come and eat. And they all went over to the tunnel entrance and began scooping out great chunks of juicy, golden-colored peach flesh. Oh, marvelous, said the centipede, stuffing it into his mouth. Delicious, said the old green grasshopper. Just fabulous, said the glowworm. Oh my, said the ladybug primly. What a heavenly taste. She looked up at James and she smiled, and James smiled back at her. They sat down on the duck together, both of them chewing away happily. You know, James, the ladybug said, up until this moment, I've never in my life tasted anything except those tiny little green flies that live on rose bushes. They have a perfectly delightful flavor, but this peach is even better. Isn't it glorious, Miss Spider said, coming over to them. Personally, I'd always thought that a big, juicy, caught in the web blue bottle was the finest dinner in the world, until I tasted this. What a wonderful, what a flavor, the centipede cried. It's terrific. There's nothing like it. There never has been. And I should know because I personally have tasted all the finest foods in the world. Whereupon the centipede, with his mouth full of peach, with juice running down all over his chin, suddenly burst into song. I've eaten many strange and scrumptious dishes in my time, like chili nuts and dandy prats and earrings cooked in slime, and mice with rice. They're really nice when roasted in their prime, but don't forget to sprinkle them with just a pinch of grime. I've eaten fresh mud burgers by the greatest cooks there are, and scrambled eggs and stink bug eggs and hornets stewed in tar, and pails and snails and lizard tails and beetles by the jar. A beet is improvised just by just a splash of vinegar. I often eat boiled slobbages, they're grand served beside minced doodle bugs and curdled egg slugs in. And have you ever tried mosquitoes' toes in one fish rose most delicately fried? The only trouble is they disagree with my inside. I'm mad for crispy wasp wings on a piece of buttered toast, and pickled spines and porcupines, and then a generous roast of dragon flesh well hung, not fresh. It costs a buck at most, and comes to you in barrels if you order it by post. I crave the tasty tentacles of octopi for tea. I like hot dogs, I love hot frogs, and surely you'll agree. A plate of soil with engine oil, a super recipe. I hardly need to mention that it's practically free. For dinner on my birthday, shall I tell you what I choose? Hot noodles made from poodles and a slice of garden holes and a rather smelly jelly made of armadillo's toes. The jelly is delicious, but you have to hold your nose. Now comes, the centipede declares, the burden of my speech. These are foods rare beyond compare. Some are right out of reach, but there's no doubt I'd go without a million plates of each. For one small mite, one tiny bite of this fantastic peach. Everyone was feeling happy now. The sun was shining brightly out of the soft blue sky, and the day was calm. The giant peach, with the sunlight glinting on its side, was like a massive golden ball sailing upon a silver sea.